to the Smart Connector podcast, which looks at the power of connection in business and life. Featuring solo episodes as well as a range of exciting interviews with entrepreneurs across multiple sectors, we offer tips and advice to build your impact, wealth and success, attract others for all the right reasons and become a Smart Connector, the architect of your amazing business and life. Welcome, my name's Jane Baylor and thanks for checking out this episode. In this interview, I'm honored and privileged to speak to a highly experienced US-based digital marketing and automation specialist, David Summerflay. David has over 20 years experience working for marketing and advertising agencies. He was also a certified small business mentor for approximately 10 years through the US Small Business Administration, where he advised hundreds of small business owners, nonprofit administrations and senior staff, as well as startups in how to grow their businesses quicker and easier. He's written for AOL Time Warner, spoken to a packed out standing room only audience at Microsoft, taught social media marketing at Johnson & Wales University and run workshops for the WordPress Foundation. And he's the author of The Road to Digital Marketing Profits and the Illustrated Guide to Digital Marketing. And additionally, he was trained in political campaign marketing by consorting with the White House Project, the Colorado Department of Education and the Center for Progressive Leadership. And he later went on to advise several political campaigns. So what a guest. We cover a really fascinating range of topics in in this interview, including why digital marketing and automation is so important for entrepreneurial success today, the attitudinal and mindset difference between what David calls business hobbyists and those who are 100% committed to their success, And we also look at how and in what way to repurpose content. And finally, why the color blue is David's visual signature and the name of his business, DMS Blue. Enjoy. Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. I have a really exciting guest for you today, David Summerfleck. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for having me, Jane. I appreciate your time. Now, David's a very experienced digital marketer, and he has so much wisdom and experience to offer in the field of automation, digital marketing, repurposing content. He has over 20 years experience working for uh, marketing and digital marketing and advertising agencies. And you've been a small business mentor for almost as long, haven't you, David? Yeah, off and on at least 10 years. I just stopped counting after a certain number. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to delve into the subject of automation and why automation matters. That's one of the things we're going to talk about because I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs daily who are, they're kind of scared of automation. They're scared of tech and it leaves them behind. And so that's really something that I want to get into with you today, David, because it doesn't have to be as scary as I think a lot of people think it is. So we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to look at repurposing content, because again, that's another thing that really makes a difference in terms of making your hard work and your effort and your really valuable creativity go further and actually make more of an impact. So David is really an expert at that. So we're just going to get into it, David. But before we do, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and your history and how you came to be a marketer, where you grew up, where you are in the world right now. Just, you know, tell us who you are. Sure. I went to college originally to be a writer. I went to a university to study writing. And in the course of that, of course, you work can work uh, internships in college. And I wanted to take on as many internships as I could because they would offset the cost of college, paying for your courses, paying for your books and so on, and also giving you experience, which as a young man I needed. So I worked several internships mm-hmm. at different newspapers and ad agencies. And In the course of that, I came to realize that there really were not very many jobs for writers where I lived geographically. And those that did exist at the time were very, very low paying. So I immediately Mm -hmm. began studying website development and digital marketing, 
which in the mid 90s, it was still relatively new. And of course, the great irony is that in the mid 90s, the business owners who really could benefit the most from being online didn't know what it was. And the irony today is that, Mm. again, the benefits that could benefit from it the most don't really grasp the depth of it and don't really want to get involved in it. Or if they do, they only get involved in what I would call the kind of like a a peripheral level where it's like you're putting your foot into Mm -hmm. the pool, but they're not really committing And that's endemic of most small businesses and startups. Either they can do it, but don't want to, or they can't do it. Either they they can't budget, they they have no resources or what have you. So unfortunately, it's one or the other in most cases. And not in all, certainly. And that's where you can get involved and really hit a home run for them. Where the will to succeed is there and the ability to meet you halfway is there. But once I graduated from college, I had the advantage of being very comfortable with writing copy mm-hmm. as, a, as a copywriter as opposed to a creative writer or like an author. I really didn't enjoy writing anymore because, you know, studying Shakespeare and Chaucer and Keats and Shelley and all <laughs> these, you know, and medieval journalism but then you go to a marketing agency and they want you to write content for the specific purpose of courses or reports to try to guide consumers in one direction or another. That wasn't as enjoyable for me, but I could do it. So I began working for different marketing agencies and uh, in between those positions, I would work as a professor as a teacher. And of course, I would also work as a freelancer or independent consultant, where you would still work with small business owners and enterprise level clients with their marketing, but as an individual. And if a project was larger or too large for an individual, then I would bring in what's called a distributed team even back then, where you would have people working with you remotely in other countries or across the United States or even in the UK or Canada. I've had those situations where we had very crazy time zones. So (laughs) yeah, I know that's really how I got started. Yeah, absolutely. So that's basically how I got started working with business owners to really help them accelerate growth, but also consolidating overhead and reducing the overhead operations that they do as well. Because as you work for more and more marketing agencies and different types of businesses, you realize that nobody really wakes up in the middle of the night saying, I need a website so I can get more customers or more clients. They wake up in the middle of the night saying, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay my mortgage this month. How am I going to put food on the table for my children? Mm -hmm. That's what keeps you up at night. They think, they think that a website, any website is going to make them number one in Google. And then they're going to be deluged with phone calls and emails. It doesn't work that way. No, sadly, it doesn't, does it, David? And we're going to get into that a little bit later. But before we do, hopefully it hasn't escaped our viewers if they're watching this video as opposed to listening to it, that you are dressed in blue. Uh, and blue is your signature colour, isn't it, David? So let's let's go into that a little bit because you've got blue glasses, you've got a blue suit, uh, blue headphones, a blue phone and a blue shirt. So And other blue glasses as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, blue Blue, all blue. Blue's a great color, actually. I love blue as well. So, so yeah. t- tell us, why did you decide to differentiate yourself in this way, David? And and even it's well, even the name of your, your business, by the way, isn't it? Yes, basically, and that's a whole other related story. But basically, I used to give an enormous amount of 
training workshops and boot camps and webinars, seminars, boot camps, workshops, what have you, on and on. Because I was very comfortable teaching after a certain point, I learned that if I gave a four-hour uh, workshop or boot camp, that A, I could easily pay the mortgage in one day, but also they were very popular and they were a great way of meeting prospective clients as business owners because they would see that A, this person knows what they're talking about, is highly conscientious and very serious. So if the do-it-yourself approach did not work, and it very, very seldom does, maybe I could talk to you after this workshop or seminar to get your opinion on something or for some type of endeavor where you, where I could help. So I never really knew what to wear. I always felt really awkward. <laughs> uh, one day my wife just said, look, just wear your favorite color all the time. People will think you're a genius. And I said, that's it. So I always preferred the color blue because blue is the, the color of the sky, of course, the color of the ocean. It's very comforting. It's very calming. And so it's I just started. Color. Right. And that's the emotion or the feeling I wanted to convey to people who felt overwhelmed. Their business was going under. They could be in financial uh, straits. And I wanted to convey a sense of calm to them, but also convey a sense of I'm a professional. I take my work very seriously, not necessarily myself, but the work very seriously. So I just started wearing blue to every event that I went to and then people would, would visually recognize me. You know, there's the, the skinny bald guy who wears all blue. Now, when I reached a point where I was semi-retired a few years ago, I basically stopped working as an agency owner and just rebranded myself and just said, look, from now on, I am DMS.blue because DMS are my initials, but it's also what I do as a digital marketing specialist who provides digital marketing solutions. And it's my initials and it's my favorite color. So I just thought, what could be more simple and what could be more direct? So I always tell everybody, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm not hard to find. Just go to Google or whatever and type in DMS.blue and you'll find me all over the internet. Amazing. Amazing. So, so David, uh, let's get, get into this issue of digital marketing and, and automation because, sure. as you said, there's a, a lot of small business owners, startups and so on that are just... They're experimenting. They're on the periphery, as you said. And what what is the impact of that, just fiddling around? Is there a problem with just not taking advice from the experts and just yes. going in and having a go and doing some of these drag and drop, you know, templates and things like that? What, what is the problem and what's the, what's the impact of them doing that? Well, and I think you also asked what's the, the, the price or the cost. Yeah. Get with the exact. Let me, let me start answering that with a, with a brief story, if I may. Yeah. A few years ago, I, I was a, a small business mentor. And someone had contacted me. And the, the person was a lawyer and the person said, I'm not getting any clients. No one's calling me. I'm not getting any emails from prospective clients. I have my do-it-yourself builder template thingamajig that I've been tinkering with, and nobody's calling me. Now, I asked the person, how long had you been doing this? And he said, oh, about five years. So for five years, you're not getting any leads, no referrals, no new clients to your website for five years. Now, oh. if you look at a lawyer, what is one client worth for a lawyer? Maybe $10,000, 
at the lower end of the spectrum, depending on what their their mm-hmm. issue may be. But certainly going to court or dealing with legal matters is, is very expensive. And, Jeez. you know, now at the higher end, it could be in the tens of thousands of dollars, much more. Easy. So I said, mm-hmm. you, could, you could have invested what, half of what you would have earned for one client and solved the problem five years ago. So during that five-year period, how many clients could you have lost? How much money could you have left on the table? Well, we don't know. Because you know, they the, the person didn't keep track, and then there was another time, maybe a year or two after that, and this was another lawyer called me up and said the same thing. Basically, my free do-it-yourselfer template, I'm not getting any phone calls at all, no emails, nothing, and I don't know what to do. And this. A uh, person was miraculous because the person had two areas of very highly con- very highly skilled emphasis in two different areas of legal practice. And at the time, I was very very tired. I was very stressed out. My wife was going through cancer treatment. I should have canceled canceled it to oh. be quite honest because I was very very stressed out. I hadn't slept much. And I was actually driving her to the doctor and waiting in the car. And I figured I could talk to the person while I was waiting in the car. And of course, I was so stressed out. And I just said, ma'am, I'm happy to answer any question that you have. So she asked me all these technical questions about SEO and e-commerce and how SEO works and content marketing and plugins and widgets and on and on. And after about an hour of talking to her, she said, I don't understand a word you said. I give up. I'm just going to go get a job at Starbucks. I give up. Really? And I said, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'd be happy to help you if you're interested, but you're not interested. So have a nice day. And the other lawyer I spoke with basically said the same thing. I would never spend money on digital marketing or a website when I can go get it for free. I have a nephew who's good at Excel. He can just tinker with it endlessly until mm-hmm. maybe one day I am uh, number one in Google. And I said, well, I hope that works for you. Have a nice day as well. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. So that's the damage that do it yourself can do is that you can lose a tremendous amount of money that you might otherwise be getting yeah. But furthermore, it can also depict a business that might be very competent as an amateur business that doesn't look good. Yeah. On my own website, I have case studies and I also show before and after images of customers and clients before they came to work with me and then after they came to work with me. And one of my long legacy clients has been with me for over 10 years now. She told me that once that she said, you know, I would go and I would meet clients and I would show them my website on my phone. And they would tell me that it looked ridiculous. It looked like a shopping list. It didn't, you know, that like some PowerPoint presentation from the seventies or eight, it didn't look professional. And if she, and, and the client said that doubted, you know, her professionalism, Mm. So we'd go with someone who was willing to invest a few thousand dollars because their way of thinking is if you can't afford a few thousand dollars to invest in a professional online presence, why would I want to work with you? Yeah. And and also, how how do you ever rank in Google? Yeah. Well, we don't know because the irony is unless you're already an expert, you're not going to know how to set all these different facets into motion. Mm. You know, I'll remember uh, a long time ago, I had to get a root canal. And I went to, I wanted to find the best dentist in town because I was very nervous. And so I went to the, the most wealthy portion of town and I found a new dentist who had just graduated from dental school. And he was a very, very nice young guy, great guy. And I asked him while, you know, I was all full of Novocaine and and pain sedatives and what have you. And I said, I got to ask you, have you ever had anyone come into your, you know, that you've seen while you were training 
who came in using these things, these butterfly clips and paper clips and whatnot. And he laughed and he said, oh, yeah. He said, actually, he said, you'd be surprised how many people I've seen come in with paper clips and rubber bands and, and staple guns and, and everything because they didn't want to spend any money. Wow. And he said, and they, did, they didn't understand the damage they were doing to themselves, mm -hmm. to how they came across to others. Mm -hmm. And invariably, I would end up having to charge them triple because of having to reduce infection and on and correct the surgery. And it would take months and months to undo the damage they did. So all of this comes into play. When is do-it-yourself appropriate? It's appropriate when the outcome doesn't matter to you. Mm. So am I going to try to fix ginseng with no prior experience in plumbing? The answer is no, because we use the kitchen sink quite often. In fact, we use every sink quite often. So I'm not going to try to fix that myself. If it's something very minor that I don't care if I mess it up or not, then I'll try the do-it-yourself approach, such as providing our pet rabbit with a new litter box. It's a very minor repair issue that I can handle. She won't complain. And if she does, no one will listen. She'll stomp her foot. We know that it won't. That's not the right size for her. But you kind of understand what my uh, point is, I hope. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I think you very eloquently put as well, because... I think there's a there's a big difference between people who are playing at business as well. And some people do play at business. They might have a corporate job or they might be very comfortable financially. Yes. And they're just having a little go. And, and might, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say to me, I draw a, a distinction with that where I I just say that I don't, take myself, you know, I like to poke fun at myself and I'm fine with that. You know, I'm not exactly Brad Pitt. You deal the hand that you've been dealt. <laughs> but I take, I take work very seriously. And, you know, for failing business owners or struggling business owners, I just say, you know, look, if you have a family who are counting on you to pay the mortgage or pay the rent or put food on the table or provide for them, that's not a game, me. No. So I don't, I don't, I take that very seriously. And I believe in moving very quickly when I work with clients because those who are ready to commit, those few who are committed, yeah, they need your help and they need you to usually drag them out of the proverbial ditch mm -hmm. and turn things around very quickly for them. And they're hiring you because they believe that you're the expert, not them. Yes. So if you, if you're, if you think you're an expert and you can do everything yourself by yourself, we're not a good fit right off the bat. And you can keep dilly dallying around for however long you want. Statistically, I don't know the statistics in the UK or in other countries, but in the US, the failure rate for a new business is quite high. It, yeah between 95 and 95 percent and it's probably a good deal higher now with covid mm. you know and so many businesses have gone under as a result of covid because they either refused to pivot or were not able to pivot mm -hmm. you know i can't tell you how many businesses locally i've seen who had no online presence at all or if they did, it was very poor or substandard. So once COVID came, if you wanted uh, something delivered to your home, or if you wanted a service provided to you remotely, you couldn't get it done. Mm. You know, so it, small business, nonprofit, startup failure is a huge, huge dilemma that there is a solution to, but they have to want the solution. They have to see the value in that yeah. and be committed to that. And like you said, if it's a hobby or just something that you do for fun, be clear about that. Yeah, exactly. Because it's really different and people are going to, you know, they're going to behave differently around it in terms of their level of commitment. 
So I, yeah, I mean, I totally, I, I totally resonate with everything that you said, David. It, it's just so important, I think, to work with professionals and experts in marketing because yeah. I always say to people that marketing is an expert discipline. If, if, if I work with experts and they're experts in their area, for example, if they are a lawyer or an accountant or, you know, they have some kind of a consulting offer or something or a coaching offer or whatever, they are, have worked very hard to gain that expertise and that special edge that, that they bring to their clients. So it, it all it always amazes me that they think that they can become marketers when in fact the the real skill of a marketer is to turn on the tap the lead generation tap and actually be able to dial it up and for me that's that is what a professional marketer should be able to do and that's a that's a big thing to do it's a real skill something that that you need to learn over many, many years of actually doing it and doing nothing but but that. At least that's what I think. I hope you agree. Well, absolutely. You know, I've been in marketing for over 20 years. And like I said, I stopped counting after 20. But even today, I, I in fact, I should say, especially today, technology changes and trends develop that weren't there five years ago. So mm -hmm. you have to be open to adapting as those technologies and, and train, trends and methodologies change as well. For many, many small business owners today, they didn't ask for the internet. They didn't want it. So a lot of older businesses and more established, what I call legacy businesses, they still, even in 2021, will resist digital marketing. They may have a very, very basic website, but they don't update it. They don't want to update it. They don't mm -hmm. care if it works on your modern phone or not. They don't care if they can accept payments online or not. They're not interested in that. Or if they're uh, on the first page of Google, they, they just don't care about that. They see it as a check mark, you know, on their to-do list. And, you know, I, I understand that perspective. So. You, you do what you can with people, but it's all about expectations and, and setting realistic goals. Mm. It's, we're having such a fascinating conversation. I'm really, really enjoying it. And it's just like sparking so many things in my mind. As I said, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs. I've got quite a big Facebook group and I talk to a lot of my podcast guests and, and so on. So I'm, I'm very well networked and I speak to small business owners all the time. And I think a lot of this unwillingness, perhaps, to engage comes from fear. And I think, also, yes. yeah, just being scared of change because the speed of change has accelerated massively. As you said, there are new things happening all the time, particularly with technology that change the game. So once you learn something about marketing or digital marketing or whatever, the chances are that six months down the line, it will have moved on again. And then you're going to be in another, you're almost in, in a perpetual cycle of having to learn new stuff. And update and yeah. make updates as well. I mean, I have maybe 10 websites myself mm -hmm. on top of, you know, client websites. And we all have to have daily backups in case the site is hacked or something breaks with the formatting or what have you, every two to three weeks, they require updating for a multitude of reasons. All the client sites need to be checked uh, and tweaked almost on a weekly basis for different hacking attempts and security issues. Many of them use e-commerce so they can accept payments for their services or for the goods that they provide. Some have issues with shipping and point of sale systems if it's a restaurant. So, and as these technologies change and make updates, you have to be ad adaptive with that. Just doing a podcast, you see all these different technologies and ways that you could 
uh, conduct a podcast and one platform works better than another. And mm -hmm. then this one platform will make updates and then it will be all weird and and everything for a week until the next update comes and, and so on and so forth. So you have to have uh, the type of mindset that you're open to adaptation. And yeah. yes, it is, it is extremely common for business owners and entrepreneurs to say, everything has to be free. Everything has to be my way. And I call that the Burger King mentality. That doesn't work in, in, in the real world. It works for super cheap food that actually is bad for you. The more you digest it, the more fat it has in it and the lower nutritional value is for you. And we all know this as adults, yeah. but people still go. So it's just, it's kind of the same uh, uh, thing with that fast food mentality, that fast food approach marketing, whether it's online or offline, is not a single item, but a process that takes time to get started and then goes for the lifetime of that business. If you're resistant to that, then you simply don't promote your business and whatever growth you may have is minimal. You know, in fact, yes, yes. I'm, I'm a strong advocate for screening potential clients and then onboarding them where I train them basically for lack of a better word and how I work and how I make decisions so that they are more informed and feel engaged in the process. And they're not coming away feeling, I don't know what's going on. And I think that's mm -hmm. very, very important. So sorry yeah, to go off on there's nothing worse. No, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, not a tangent. It's, it's a very uncomfortable feeling being bamboozled by stuff and just feeling as though you don't understand. And I think there's a difference between not understanding and understanding something at a high level. If, if you don't understand at all and somebody says, don't worry, I'll fix it for you, then, well, to a certain point, that's okay. But there's another a sort of level of discomfort whereby you're like, well, now I'm just completely dependent on this person. I don't really understand what they're doing. And I, I know and that they should be good. So I think you don't have to understand if you're a client, you don't have to understand all the detail because that's what you're paying somebody like you for. But you do have to understand why it's important and what's really going on at a high level, don't, don't you think? Yes. And what I always do is to illustrate the point, when I worked for different marketing agencies, then I would go in between positions. I would work as a freelancer. For the first few years, I struggled with clients because I didn't know how to apply the very deliberate structure and processes of the larger agency to how the individual would work with or without mm -hmm. a small team in place. So I had to gradually find a way to apply the structure that I had gotten from these marketing agencies to myself. So yeah. that's where I, I learned the importance of screening potential clients. And it's mainly to see, are they really committed? Are, are they just doing this? Can I, can I actually, can I use any expletives on your podcast? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's an okay. adult podcast. Shits, <laughs> what I call, what I call shits and giggles. With, a lot of people will contact you just for shits and giggles. What can I get out of this guy for free? Can I get you to fix my, my broken or hacked website for $10 or whatever? In fact, I, I, I could tell you one or two crazy stories like that. But I had to learn how to put processes into place so that I would screen first to see, to gauge their level of commitment and seriousness and dedication to their own business. Then if we're a good fit for each yeah. other, then I would say, okay, we can have one or two more conversations. Then there's a paid discovery session where I provide them with a quite extensive workbook. The idea being mm -hmm. you read through the workbook, you do the exercises. Now, when we talk, you know everything that you need to know, the most important information, rather, to get the most from digital marketing. Not only that, 
but you also have the heart and soul of what is good quality evergreen content that we can then focus on repurposing because now you'll know what repurposing is and you'll be informed on that. So you'll be able to talk to me about David. I know what my brand is. I know what, who my ideal consumer is. David, I know what content I'm going to write and how to repurpose it. I know what my SEO should be and so on. I understand all of these things. So they can't say, I don't understand any of these terms. No, you do. Yeah. You understand the, the most important ones. And so I, it took me a few years to put that in place. Mm. And yes, most clients won't read. It's unfortunate, but most people won't read today. So I always go over the workbook with them during that paid discovery session and assume that they did not read it or, com- or complete the workbook. If they did, they're saving themselves a lot of time and a lot of value. But I, I think it's really important to have a very deliberate, very thought out testing process that you use to guide your customers or clients, whether you are the business owner or the marketer trying to help the business owner. Because at the end of the day, most people are not going to want to invest. It's just an idea that, you know, they're, they're, they're toying with, or they're not committed to, or they're shopping around for the lowest price on earth as opposed to value. That's the majority. So you want to work with the minority. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And it, it is true that when you speak to clients, you're often bumping or prospects, you're often bumping up against their mindset. And I think it's really important if you are a, an ambitious, committed and serious business owner or an agency owner as, as, as you are, to actually find like-minded people who appreciate your commitment and your integrity, really. Because, because as you said, there are so many people, they don't know what they want. They don't want to invest in themselves. They, they are really unable uh, to back themselves. And I think that is very, very common. And, and it's almost, uh, it's just a bit of a mindset, a failing mindset, I think. You know, my, my, yeah, my wife uh, likens it to dating. You know, if you're dating and you say, well, who is your ideal fit? And you just say, well, anyone attractive. <laughs> well, you know, don't don't be surprised if you have, you know, a trail of of you know failed relationships where, you know, the the relationships aren't delivering the lo- longevity that we all want. You That's know, right. I remember I, I remember meeting a man once at a networking event, and he said, "Could you help me with my dating site?" And I said, "Oh, absolutely, sure, I could do that." So what have you done so far by yourself for free? Because I knew, I knew that he had done that. They all do. What have you (laughs) tried to do already by yourself for free? And how did that work out for you? And you knew, you already know the answers. It didn't go well. Otherwise he wouldn't be coming to me for help. But anyway, his take on that was very different. So he said, well, I have a dating website. And he said, uh, just, Nobody is signing up. Nobody's finding it. Not only that, but the people who are paying are telling me that the website doesn't work and on and on and on. And they want refunds and whatever. So I said, tell me what you've already done by yourself so far for free. And he said, well, oh, I love going to bars. I said, is that a fact? Yes, it is. (laughs) So he said, so this is 100% factual. So he said, so I would go to a bar every night. And I would meet attractive ladies or, or or nice men or what have you. And I would ask them if they were good in web development or if they knew anything about it. And I would buy them several rounds of beers and offer to buy them a meal in exchange for looking at my website. And then I would give them the username and password to log in. And I said, no, you've <laughs> got to be kidding. You've got to be joking. Really? He, said, he said, no, that's what I've done. I said, how many people have access to your website now? He said, oh, maybe 15. And I just said, <laughs> and I said, well, look, I can help you, but I don't, I don't drink and I can't work for peanut quite literally. So if you're interested in investing realistically, I can help you. You know, we can, you know, dig into your site, make sure that it works flawlessly. 
get rid of all these scavengers and, and hobbyists and whatever. We can turn this thing around. Locally, you have no competition for dating websites locally. So we could easily make you number one in Google within a few months, if not sooner. But you have to be willing to invest some kind of money to do this. Are you willing to do that? He said, no, I already told you I buy you beer and food. I said, I have plenty of food in my kitchen. Have a nice day, you know. So you get out what you put in. This was real, a real person. Very depressing, really. Yeah, that's that's well, it is really, and and I would imagine that his uh, dating site probably failed because with that approach, it's not a good prognosis, is it? No, I looked for it actually. I wrote on my calendar to check two weeks later to see what had happened out of curiosity, and it was gone. And that usually is the case. Usually they're gone within, you know, six weeks or six months. But to speak to repurposing, a great deal of repurposing, you have to start with the foundational approach first. So I I wanted Mm -hmm. to address repurposing content, but I'm not sure where you wanted to get started. Yeah, well, a lot of people, I'm, I'm actually running a couple of rooms on, on Clubhouse and we did one last night, which was a um, standout mm. pure, pure difference, uh, rise above the noise. That was the one that we did last night. So we were actually having a, a debate on there about video content because I think a lot of people, they put a lot of effort into showing up on video because it's a good way of connecting with people. It's because in a way it involves all the senses, doesn't it? But what a lot of people say to me again is they say, do you know what it took me all this time to make a video and then edit it and then, and then put some effects on and put a thumbnail at the front and, you know, it took me all day to do one video and then I uploaded it to LinkedIn and nobody watched it. So I get that a lot. And I know that, you know, some of the people that I've interviewed on the podcast, for example, I have one guy who's a, he's a former actor, actually, but he's really, really slick on video. He's really good. And he's really learned how to kind of distribute it across multiple platforms. And he does that daily. So Mm I think a lot of people, they just, they get so kind of overwhelmed and intimidated by the thought of actually being out there to that extent. I mean, I would say that that is one thing because you have to be comfortable with being everywhere for starters and and people finding you all over the place. But I also think that there's a big technical block again, that people just, they just don't know what to do or where to start or who to go to. Yeah. Yeah. To st- well, there's several, there's several issues there. There's mm-hmm. several issues there to unpack. Yeah. Uh, first of all, there's the technical proficiency that a lot of people just may not know where to begin with that technically. Yeah. Secondly, you know, a lot of people don't feel comfortable in front of the camera. I don't feel comfortable in front of the camera. I never have. But it's it's what I tell them and what I tell myself is, It's not about auditioning for a a soap opera or something. What it's about is believing in the value of what you are communicating, what you're putting out there more than the color blue or if my hair is nicely trimmed or what have you, whatever the case may be. It's about the value of the content. I've seen several people on YouTube who do very powerful videos that gets fairly good traction and they simply talk directly into the camera and just say, this is why we're here. And they look very serious. And what I, what I do is I'll actually make notes and I'll tack it to the monitor and I'll look into the camera and just say, today we're here to talk about, X, Y, Z. And if you want personal one-on-one help, here's how you can reach me. And that's it. I know my videos are not uh, studio quality. I mean, you know, let's get real. Could I do it that way? Sure. 
but I'm semi-retired. If they, if they work, they work. If they don't, they don't. It's about delivering valuable content to people so that you can walk away feeling, wow, this guy actually cares and he's giving me some type yeah. of, of valuable content that I can try to learn from. And that's really how you differentiate yeah. yourself. The more authentic you are, yeah. the more true you are to yourself, the more you find what's called niche marketing, where you fit in with a very narrow clientele. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I my, my niche market are, are business owners who have had it. Those, that's my niche market. Mm -hmm. Business owners who are struggling on the brink of failure and ruin are already there and have just had it. I'm willing to put it on a credit mm -hmm. card to turn things around. I'll do whatever you say. I'll make it work if you tell me what to do. Oh, my God. Imagine yeah. what I could do with a soldier like that, you know, whereas yeah. a hobbyist yeah. wouldn't know what to do. So, you know, I think that's key. And as far as, you know, repurposing content, that's a different topic altogether where you want to kind of take a step backward and say, first of all, who are my ideal consumers that I'm trying to reach out to. And at face value, it sounds like a very simple question because most people will answer anyone with a pulse, anyone with money, <laughs> right? Just like dating. Well, that, that won't work because if you're a web developer or a digital marketer like me and you say, well, my ideal consumer is anyone who has a business, that won't work. <laughs> Because I'll end up spending all day, every day, answering the same repetitive questions over and over and over again. How much is this? How much is that? How do I do this myself? How do I do that myself? How can I, you know, finagle this or whatever? So, no. So, you, once you're more specific about who you want to work with and why, mm -hmm. where do they live? What do they do? What do they look at online? What are their uh, aptitudes, what websites do they frequent? What types of publications do they read? Do they read? What are their annual uh, revenue? How much money do they need to earn in order to work with you? So you can break even at the very least. Yes. So you have to have all of these considerations identified then once you know who your ideal consumer is, yeah. then you can begin crafting content that speaks to their pain points. Yes, yes. Very, very different. So you want to speak to their pain point, but also speak to it from a position of some authority. I don't know about the struggles that a dentist would go through. So I can't really speak to the struggles of a dentist. I can help them with their online marketing. But I don't know anything about the tools that they use and how many office staff they, they would hire or need or how the, what papers they would file and so on. If I did know these things, I could speak to their pain points uh, very uniquely and better target them as, an, as a preferred clientele. Mm -hmm. So if, that, if you kind of see where I'm going with this, if I'm a digital marketer who used to own a body or detailing shop as a mechanic, then I could definitely speak to the needs of these types of clientele more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. So, but you want to be able to address these concerns and know who are you? Who yeah. are you trying to reach and why? Yeah. And then once you know that, then you write content that speaks to, to these people's authentic painful needs, then you want to find three or four uh, social media channels that they're going to use mm -hmm. and start modestly and grow from there. So, you know, if your ideal consumers are lawyers, they may not frequent YouTube. You know, they may frequent specific legal websites or specific legal social media channels or groups yeah. on Facebook, for example. So you, the more surgical you are starting out, the better it is. There's an old saying in politics that all politics starts local. 
And it's the same way with marketing, that all marketing starts local. Wherever you are, you live in a city, in a state or district or what have you. So you want to start local and grow from there. Amazon was a local book retailer at first. Mm, And then slowly, and then slowly, I don't believe Amazon even showed a profit until just a few years ago because they kept taking the money that they made and reinvesting it into infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they yeah. did that on and on and on. So there are lessons there to be gleaned from those with, you know, ears to hear it. So if you talk about repurposing content, you have to address, you know, how to use that, how to scale that, yeah. branding. What is your brand? You know, for me, I know my visual brand. It's going to be blue. It's going to have my logo. And once you start doing that, you want it to all have the same shades or the same tint, the same logo, preferably the same duration, the same tone. You know, God forbid I do one video where I have one type of personality and then another one with a different (laughs) personality, right? Or what if I have an actor one day and then a different actor the next? <laughs> that's going to that's gonna look odd. <laughs> yeah, because consistency is very reassuring, isn't it? Um, no. We had a conversation before we went on air about authenticity and about how important it is to show up and just be yourself. But I, I don't know whether you agree with this, David, but I think being authentic is also about being consistent because it builds trust, doesn't it? And that's the thing in short supply, particularly online. So if people go and see you, what, what makes them feel good is actually having the same experience every time or a similar experience. So. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the internet is filled with magical, what I call magical guru guys. People who tell you that you can make a million dollars overnight with no money down and very minimal effort and, 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 you know, only work a few hours per week and make a million dollars and have a successful business. I've never met a single person yet who's been able to do that. And I've talked to hundreds and hundreds. I've never met a single person who's done that. It's just a load of rubbish. And they're, they're, they're selling something. They have their own agenda and they're selling you this mythology because they know people want the fast food approach. That's right. Life doesn't work that way. Listen, we all want COVID to be over. Everybody is saying, well, when can we go back to the way it was before? Well, wait a minute. COVID isn't interested in your desire to go to a ball game. COVID wants host bodies to go and in fact, (laughs) take away the host bodies Take away the host bodies for one month. Now you have no more COVID. <laughs> they, they, they've done that successfully in other countries. But the countries that will not institute a strict lockdown for one month, they have it and it won't go away. They can't get rid of it. Well, I wonder why. It makes perfect sense. It's the same thing. Once you commit to something 100% and you see only that, with blinders on, you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. You're going to achieve that. Yeah, yeah. I love that, David. Well, listen, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you today. What an amazing and fascinating conversation we've been having. So I just wanted to say um, thank you to you. And David, tell us about your podcast and how our viewers and listeners can find you if they want to. Sure. Um, First of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. I I wish we had more time to talk. I could just go on and on about this subject because I'm very, very passionate about it. Uh As far as getting in touch with me, I'm very easy to find. You could go to Google. You could go to any web browser and just type in dms.blue. And I'm all over the internet. And my website is dms.blue. My podcast is called, what else? The David Summerfleck Podcast. And it's basically me answering uh, uh, listener questions about business and marketing, but also interviewing experts in their own fields of endeavor. So that could be, I interviewed one gentleman who had a lifestyle engaged in gangster lifestyles. We talked about gangster rap 
Then we had another gentleman talking about business marketing. Today, I'm uh, uh, speaking with a scholar in digital marketing communications, where we're going to talk about all kinds of subjects. So we talk about business innovation, digital marketing, and culture and related topics. And if somebody out there has a business question, you can actually go to dms.blue slash podcast guest. And you can click on the appropriate link and leave me a voice message 24 hours a day. And if it's a good question, I can answer it in a podcast episode. Wow. Well, that's that's really, really great. Thank you for that, David. And I'm, I am going to invite you to my clubhouse rooms as well, which it would be really amazing if you could join us. So sure. yeah, thank you very much again. What a great interview. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening in. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to rate and review my podcast as it will help me bring the power of connection to the world. I work one-to-one to help entrepreneurs ignite the power of authentic connection in their businesses and lives. I also help them accelerate their results through attracting and converting more of their ideal clients. And if this is something you'd like to do too, why not head on over to www.idealclientsuccess.com masterclass and I'll show you how.